all the way back to where it all started. Essential Elements, Gold Book, one. I have not looked at this book in many years. So I'll go through, I'll give some commentary on what I think for each one of these exercises. And uh, I'm hoping to get through the whole book right now. First note, everything open. One thing that I think is important to remember for Open G is that you can keep a lot of other fingers down, especially on your right hand, like you can keep your whole right hand down and the note stays pretty much the same, actually improves a little bit. So that's something that you can always play around with. Um, Anytime that you have an open G and it sounds like it maybe is not in tune with the people that are around you, it doesn't sound as good as you want it to, you can add some resonance in your right hand. Number two. So something that I'll do for these long notes is I'll vary a little bit when uh, I start the note, I'll try to start as quietly as I possibly can and crescendo to as loud as I can get. And sometimes I'll do it backwards. So starting as loud as I think um, I possibly can, getting to as quiet as I can. I'll demonstrate that right now. starting loud. So something that I think it's important to notice for, I believe, pretty much this whole book, there are no editorialized notes on top of these quarter notes that would say that they should be longer or shorter, so there's no accents, there's no staccatos, um, especially not right here. So I'm trying to go always for full value quarter notes that pretty much touch each other with just a little clear start to each note. You don't want to clip and have really short notes like at least not in this context. Number five.
so something that goes along with what I was just saying about the length of these quarter notes is that yes, it's easy to continue that when you're playing uh, you know notes right back to back. So these E's that are all in a row right at the beginning. Uh, sometimes the tendency can come in to clip the note when you're going to a rest. So you really want to touch the rest that follows the note. So like in these first two measures. <laughs> The sound goes right until I snap on B2 or when I tap my foot on B2 or whatever have you. Number seven to D now. Number eight, now with a repeat, back to the beginning. Touchdown, number nine. So one thing that I really like about the way that this book starts, um, just teaching a basic sound with no, uh, no rhythm and no particular amount that you have to rest for is actually really nice because it gives you as a beginning student or as a beginning teacher an opportunity to, to show that, you know, when you're, when you're going to take a breath in, it should be really relaxed and uh, without a whole lot of effort. And having these just bars be totally open that just says rest, as long as you need to get a good breath, is totally fine. <laughs> Nice, let everything out. Easy breath in. Number ten. On to number eleven. So exactly the same as number 10, just with the addition of the treble clef and the time signature. Number 12. <laughs> Something that seems to be a little bit different about number 12 and number 13 right off the bat is that you only have one beat of rest 
to take a good breath in. So if you find that you're having trouble doing that, something that I would recommend is that you make sure that you actually waste as much air as you can when you're playing. Meaning that by the time you get to the last, well, that would be beat three of bars two and four, uh, the last note that you have to play, you are close to actually being empty um, so that you can, you know, it's, it's easier to take a breath when you're close to empty rather than you've got a lot of gas still in your lungs uh, so that you're not taking like a breath on top of another breath. Number 14 now. they call that one rolling along and not Mary had a little lamb. Definitely Mary had a little lamb. Okay, so for 15, I don't know if I'll do all of these rhythm exercises, uh, but I think I'll do some that are in the beginning just to give you an idea of how I would think about going through them. So I want you to clap and count the rhythm while tapping. Clap the rhythm while counting and tapping. That's actually a lot of things to do, especially if you've never done something like this before. So I think I'm going to do two parts of that and then the other two parts. Um, so to tap the rhythm and count it at the same time, I've been tapping with my foot. I hope that that's coming through clearly. Um, so that's just what the quarter note is. And then I'll count one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one. That demonstrates kind of what uh, is called subdivision, which is where you're thinking of these little, you know, they have in the book little ampersands uh, showing and between the notes. I think that that's a good idea. Um, if you're starting to, you know, if you're just starting to learn some kind of formalized rhythm like this, to start to learn subdivisions right away and to start to really internalize them is a good idea. Um, but clapping, counting, and tapping all at once as your first exercise in the book that's asking you to do anything like that is a little bit tricky, actually. Um, so that's the first part of how I might think about that. And then, you know, so we'll do another set of two. I'll tap the quarter note, and now I will clap the part, which is what's written. And now I'll count out loud and clap. One and two and three and four and 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 one and two and and I'm in 
mistake. So the last bar should last two bars. I'll go from there. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and three. Now I'll put all three things together. One and two and three and four and one and two and three. And one and two and three and four 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 and okay. I think that that's probably enough to get the idea of the counting and clapping exercises. I don't know if I'll do any more. If anybody is watching this in the future and wants me to go through uh, other later exercises that show up in the book, please just ask and I'll do that. Um, but for now, I think that's a little bit tedious to go through all of them like that. One should give you the idea. So 16 has the same rhythm that we just really did a deep dive on how to study, so it should be very easy. And I'll keep tapping. <laughs> So one important thing to keep in mind is uh, that just because you're not playing and you have two beats of rest, let's say, uh, that's not an excuse to fall asleep at the wheel. You still really have to pay attention. Uh, and, you know, you could say play the rest, meaning that your attention is still really focused on what you're doing, even if you're not actually producing any sound at that moment. Because I got to the end of that and I almost spaced out a little bit and missed the repeat in those two beats of rest at the very end. So don't do that. Okay, odd cross buns, number 17. So I actually don't like this little instruction that it gives right after uh, the title for Hot Cross Buns. It says, check your embouchure and hand position. You know, if you're only on number 17 of the Gold Essential Elements book, I don't really think that you should be checking your own embouchure. You should try to keep the air inside the clarinet when you're blowing out, and you should have in your mind... Um, what you want the sound to be like and beyond that i don't think you should really be worrying too much about what your face actually looks like while you're playing you're still just figuring it out hand position is important um yeah but this early in the book i would file that under the same category as checking your embouchure really just focus on producing a good sound and staying in rhythm for right now. Okay, go tell Aunt Rhody. And, you know, I'm going to obey the, this is where they add the breath marks in, uh, the little commas above the, it looks like every two bars in this example. Sometimes composers put breath marks because they actually just want a space there. And even if you don't have to take a breath, you should try to put a space 
either by taking a short breath or lifting the sound off. And that's something that, you know, will, is a little bit more advanced that we'll talk about more in the future. But for right now, I'm going to try to actually take a breath every time that there's a breath marked. possible to make a little mistake even if you've been doing this for a long time. I will go on to number 19 and I'm not going to write the note values in or show you how that's done. That's for you and your teacher. Um, so I'll try to read this as it's written below the staff and see if I can't not mess it up. So we'll skip this rhythm study. A whole note is pretty easy to understand. Um, it's the same rhythm as I'll play right now in number 21. So something that I'm noticing that's a bad habit for myself is that sometimes when I take a breath, I actually open my mouth up all the way. Like I take my jaw and I open it and take it away from the reed. It's not something that you necessarily want to do. Um, you probably actually don't want to do that. Uh, although it's a habit that creeps into my playing from time to time. Um, so when I'm going forward now, I'm going to be really, uh, I'm going to try to really stay on top of this idea that when you take a breath, you're just breathing through your corners, really. Um, so you keep your top teeth on top of the mouthpiece and you keep your bottom lip and your bottom teeth really right where they are. And it's just that the muscles up here kind of relax and you can open your corners up and breathe nicely through the corners of your mouth. Uh, so for duets, right now, I'll just play the A part and then the B part, um, and if we get into trios and things later on in the book, I'll, I'll do the same thing. I'll just go through each one, and maybe eventually in the future I'll make like a multi-track of all of the duets, all of the ensemble pieces, so that you can hear what those are like, and you know I can talk a little bit more about ensemble playing. But uh, for right now, I'll just go through A and then be afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. 
on to number 24. This one is a lot more fun if you have other people to play with. be real. It's time for a quiz. Well, I'll play through the quiz. I won't draw the bar lines in right now because that wouldn't be very entertaining for anybody. Two new things right in a row on number 27. Uh, new note and the fermata. So the fermata is kind of like the idea of the first few just making a note exercises in this book where you can play it as long as you like. Um, and maybe a good rule of thumb in a lot of cases is that it should be double the actual value of the note. So if it's a half note, you play it for at least four beats. If it's a whole note, you play it for at least eight beats. That tends to be a good rule of thumb um, in a lot of music that you encounter. Not always. Um, so for A, actually a lot of the same idea as open G. You can keep a lot of things down, especially on your right hand. You can keep a lot of keys down. Um, and that is important, especially later on when you start to add things where you go like from a G to a C. If you already have your whole right down, right hand down, it makes it a lot easier. A is another one of those notes where that's possible. So, actually, I think maybe I'll try to do a different A for each time that I play an A in this little exercise just to give you an idea of what that looks like. 
Remix. Does that mean a remix of number 28 for number 29? I'm not sure. bridge and instead of doing a repeat back to the beginning I'll just go right on to the second part so I'll play part A part B right back to back with no repeat So as the note above this little exercise um, explains, we know this as Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, um, which I think is based on a French folk song. Um, and Mozart wrote a very famous set of uh, variations for the piano based on this tune. And if you're teaching kids about um, theme and variations, or if you're someone that's interested in theme and variations, that is like a quintessential example that you have to talk about um, because it really goes pretty crazy in the elaboration of the ornaments and everything and, uh, and the way that he treats this theme. Uh, but it still is done in a way where it's really easy and really clear for somebody who has no experience listening to that kind of thing um, to know where the melody is and to actually still be able to hear it even within the elaborations. So I really recommend listening to it or playing it for your students or what have you. Okay, number 34. Hmm. Draw these symbols in. Draw these symbols where they belong and write in the note names before you play. Okay, so I'll play it the way that it would turn out if you drew these symbols in, but I'm not going to actually do that. Um, 
strikes me right off the bat that one thing that uh, might be missing from this is, you know, maybe they should have asked you to draw in a breath mark somewhere. I mean, up until this point, it doesn't really ask you to play any more than two bars without taking a breath. And in this one, um, it seems to want you to play all four bars without taking a breath, which is very doable. And that's an interesting exercise to try. Or you could say, well, draw a breath mark in where you think that there should be a breath mark in. And that's equally interesting um, as a learning tool. But I really just think that you should be deliberate about one of those two options. Or, you know, explain that difference and, and actually try to do both things um, if you have that kind of time and inclination. Okay. Number 33. <laughs> So it shows you the standard way of playing B natural with your middle finger. And yeah, that's the one that you're going to use probably the most often. But um, I really recommend starting new players uh, on alternate fingerings that are practical alternate fingerings as early as possible. So I'm also going to do this exercise uh, just for right now. I don't know if I'll I don't think I'll treat every B natural, every exercise that has a B natural as something that where I'm going to practice it both ways. But when I'm learning the note, as you do in number 33, I would also teach this fingering, which is one and the banana key or the fork, some people call it, on the right hand. And I think that that fingering should show up in the back of the book. If you look at the fingering chart, I'll just make sure of that. Um, it'll be useful for talking about all of the other fingerings in the future. And it does. You know, this book actually does a pretty good job at the back of, of showing you all of the alternate fingerings. And there's one thing that I disagree with, but we'll talk about that as it uh, arises. So for right now, 33 with this forked alternate B natural finger. So that can be a little weird to get used to actually finding this finger, um, finding the right place for this ring finger. But I think that really if you if you start to learn how to do those things earlier on, it just improves and increases your dexterity later on. You don't get locked into like one way of doing it and now you have to learn a whole new thing. It's it's I think it's easier if you're learning at the beginning to just learn all of the options and that will arise again with different fingerings. Um, for right now, when I go through, I'll just do, you know, one fingering or the other, and that will be enough of a lesson in, you know, number 33 will be enough to, to say, like here, use this fingering or use this fingering. They're both equally as good. Number 34. Thirty-five. 
So number 36 introduces the idea of starting on a pickup. Um, up until this point, we've been starting always on beat one or the downbeat, and now we're going to start on a pickup. Um, and I agree pretty much with their definition of what a pickup note is, so I'm not going to go into that anymore. But um, just to, to sort of demonstrate how to think about that, I will actually count off one, two, three before I come in on four. One, two, Okay, now for 37, 38, 39, okay, so 37 we're introducing dynamics, which, you know, I think again if you go all the way back to the beginning and practice the long notes with starting softly, going loud, starting loud, going soft, um, you're learning dynamics I think a little bit better than you're learning how to do dynamics on the instrument a little bit better than you are right here in these examples because now you know you're adding on top of rhythms and notes which still at this point are pretty new but you know that's maybe a little nitpicky and I think that this is okay too uh, the way that it is in the book so I'm not going to do 37. I'm going to go right on to Jingle Bells. And this just has two dynamics, mezzo forte, all the way until the last four bars of the piece, and then it's forte. I think, you know, I, in the second to the second line, the last line, uh, I skipped the first breath mark, and I think that's okay. Um, I think it's okay now that we're getting later on in the book to maybe start to think about longer phrases and take fewer breaths. So maybe try, you know, taking breath every four bars and see what that feels like. That's an option. Okay, my dreidel now has all three dynamics that we've just been introduced to, medium, soft, loud. I like the note that's uh, in here after my dreidel. It says, use full breath support at all dynamic levels. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, and I think that that's a good reason to, again, think about having all of these notes be 
full value and all almost all almost touching each other a little bit uh, because it's it's a good safeguard against doing these dynamics with you know by removing fret support you know if you're playing long notes it's harder to do that kind of a thing um, and easier to play dynamics that are actually really well supported and sound nice so that's a good note okay now we're learning eighth notes so um, I get I don't think I'll go through the whole rhythm clapping tapping thing again uh, for number 40 but I will just briefly say that if you remember when we did it the first time it's you know one and two and three and four and the uh, ands are the eighth notes so if you did the counting the right way you know when rhythm was first introduced you already know what eighth notes are and how to think about them and really how to execute them. So now we're just adding, uh, you know, actual pitches to the subdivisions that we should have had going in our head most of the time anyway. Okay, so I'll go to number 41. improves your sound always sit straight and tall yes I agree with that mostly um, the one thing that I would add is that you know you should never be stiff it's really possible to be sitting up straight and tall um, but to actually be very relaxed about it feel very loose in your shoulders and your neck um, think that eventually it's will prove really important if it hasn't proved really important already that we should start teaching early good habits of use and always sit straight and tall maybe could lead you to be a little bit rigid if you weren't careful so I would just add that little caveat and this one is piano 43 I like that one. One thing that I would um, note is that in measure three, you know, it ends with a measure three ends with a half note D going to the last measure of the piece, uh, the last measure of the little example, rather. And I think it's important to keep the sound actually going forward through that note. So for those last two bars, actually growing out of the D to the F um, rather than something like this where you kind of let it die away. If you're not careful that half note can be a little bit boring and you could do something easy with it like the second example. 
but if you actually care for it a little bit, it um, it makes the phrase a lot more complete and a lot more connected. Okay, number forty-four. <laughs> This says it's a quiz. I don't know what would make it a quiz. Your teacher would make it a quiz. The teacher would make it a quiz, maybe. <laughs> Six talks about conducting. That's a good thing to get into. Um, it's another way of getting the rhythm into your body, like tapping and clapping is. If you actually follow along with these patterns that are on the page, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one. and start to feel what the beat feels like somewhere in here, somewhere at the tip of your fingers, somewhere in your arm. Um, I think that's actually a really good learning exercise. I don't ever remember uh, someone, you know, when I was first going through this book as a kid, I don't remember anyone having me actually conduct and seeing what that felt like, but I think that that would be actually a really interesting exercise um, for a kid to go through. This is tea without any sweetener in it, by the way. It's not coffee or something horrible, which could... Um, really mess up your read and mess up your your clarinet it's just a, a plain plain black tea still probably not the best but you know it's better than coffee or like a coca-cola or something anyway 47 <laughs> Okay, we're getting into, it's going to list Allegro, Moderato, Andante. Cool. All right, so I actually have a metronome somewhere that gives an indication of what makes something Allegro, what makes something Moderato. So Allegro, according to this metronome, which I think I agree with, Anything from 120 to about 168 beats per minute is Allegro. So I'll go right at the bottom end of that, which is perfect for a Sousa March, and maybe I'll start using the metronome for more of these. I'm going to turn it down a little bit, though. I think you should still be able to hear that. It seems like that might be a little bit fast for uh, like a fourth or fifth grader that's first learning how to play the clarinet. That actually might be a little bit fast. So, you know, Maybe we're meant to take these tempo markings in this book with uh, a small grain of salt. And I think that would be fine too. Like more reasonable for this piece, for this little excerpt might be. If 
But if you have a kid that can play at a 120 or 132 or 152 or, you know, whatever, that's, that's great. I, you know, this might be a good little exercise to go through, uh, you know, how quick can you get and still be accurate. So moderato is kind of a narrow range, like 108 up to about 120. So I'll do it at 108. And we'll see what that sounds like. And we have a new note, which is A. You know, I think it might be a good idea when you're learning, like, you know, we've gone through a couple of new notes now, and I think it might be a good idea to learn the note on its own, like you did at all the way back at the beginning of the book. Um, so just take the note and sit on it for a minute, just to get what it sounds like and what it feels like in your ear and uh, in your body a little bit. Okay. Now, 108, number 49. <laughs> Okay, and now at number 50 and 51, we're, boy, it seems like we've added a lot of new things in these, like, two pages that we're on right here, um, but that's always sort of the nature of these beginning books, I think, is like, you know, you start from nothing, so the curve of learning up it can be really steep sometimes. Um, once again, you know, if you practiced learning a note, just one note with starting soft, getting loud. You've already learned what a crescendo is, and if you've practiced soft, or loud to soft, rather. You've already practiced a diminuendo. So I think it's a good idea to do that on... Um, Anytime that you learn a new note, just pick one note, do a crescendo, do a diminuendo, as big as you can. And, you know, then when you get to something like number 50 or 51, you already know what it feels like to do that. And you can just add in these other notes rather than trying to do it all at once. So 51. An important thing to realize is that, uh, you know, the crescendo is for one measure, and then the second measure, you're at forte, and you stay at forte for the length of the entire measure, and even the first note of the third measure that you play should still be forte. Um, if I was writing a book like this, I don't know, I might put another, like, parenthetical thing underneath uh, the second measure to make sure that a student that's playing it for the first time doesn't play it, like, you know, they get to a nice forte. And then by the time they get to the next measure, they're already down like a whole dynamic level or like sometimes more than a whole dynamic level. So just be sure to keep the forte, honor it all the way through the bar that it's written until you're told to do something else. Okay. Performance Spotlight we're on to now. So, this is... Okay, so the last two pages actually make some sense. Like, we learned a lot of new stuff in the last two or three pages, and now we have two pages where we're just doing, like, little excerpts to solidify the things that we've already learned. Um, okay. 52. These are warm-ups these first few okay 
Okay, and if you are like an elementary school music teacher, band director, um, rhythm rap is probably everyone's favorite one when it's time to do that because it has a stomp in it. This is actually interesting because it doesn't um, it doesn't have any instructions underneath it like the other ones do, like clap the rhythm and you know count the rhythm at the same time, or rather tap the rhythm and count the rhythm at the same time. Uh, it just says clap, and then there's one stop. So I guess you're starting to learn as a student at this point, like how to internalize the pulse, and that's cool. Or you're learning how to internalize the pulse and how to um, follow along with a conductor, maybe. So I don't have a conductor, so we're just going with internalized pulse right now, but it'll be like one, two, three. Nice little corral now. This chorale actually uh, leads me to a little criticism that I have for this whole book up until this point, I guess. Um, well, yeah, this whole book, as far as I've seen at this point, is a better way to say it. Um, you're, you're learning how to play notes by always, like, articulating them, which seems weird. It seems like it's, uh, you know... If you have to tongue notes and move your fingers, that's like two jobs. I mean, it's really like four or five jobs, but it's it's two different jobs to do. And if you're just teaching a beginner, like why not have them slur something like this? Because then it takes their tongue out of it. They can just think about having a good airstream and uh, good support and putting the air into the clarinet like they should be doing. So, you know, for the corral, like I think that you should slur this one. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that I think that this one might be better slurred. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that that kind of flies in the face of something that somebody was thinking when they wrote this book, and it'll teach you what a slur is later, but, mm, you know, if I were taking a kid through this, I think I would have them uh, slur a lot more things a lot earlier. But enough about that. Number 53. Part 1. <laughs> Thank you. 
now part two. <laughs> This um, is, you know, again, like another criticism, maybe you're meant to do this part of the book with a band director who will tell you, you know, as a section or as a whole band where you're supposed to take a break and breathe. Um, but there's nothing in here, like in the music, that would actually tell you where to breathe. So I think either, you know, you need to do a lesson with your students on you know, deciding how and when to breathe or uh, make it clear that, you know, you need to follow the person who's leading you in this part so that you know when to breathe. Otherwise, it's like there's not enough information here right now to, to do a great job of that. Okay, number 54, this one is fun if you have somebody else to do it with because it's around um but for right now i'll just do it once through straight up <laughs> made a mistake in the second line so if you look at the rehearsal numbers those are the numbers in the box I'm gonna start at the pickups to 11 so the third measure of the second line where it says four take <laughs> On to number 56. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
ending. Uh, I actually didn't do a great job with the dynamics, especially in the second line. Um, but, you know, I'll be better the next time around. Number 57. skipping the repeat. Um, I actually remember hard, hard Rock Blues number 58 here from when I was a kid, so that's pretty interesting. Okay. Okay, introducing ties. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think they do a pretty good job of explaining that. I'm not really going to go into it too much right here. I'll just play number 59 and then number 60. Okay, pretty good job of explaining uh, dotted notes as well. So this is what that sounds like for number 61. Big surprise, it sounds the same as the uh, one that preceded it, number 60. It's just written out a little bit differently. So it just shows you a couple of different ways that you can, you know, notate the same basic rhythm. Number 62. And I think uh, from here on out with this book, I think that it probably makes the most sense for me not to always do the repeats. Um, if you're watching this to get a sense of what it sounds like later on, uh, you can always just back it up and listen to it again. But, you know, for the sake of getting through these more efficiently, I think I'm going to leave out the repeats unless I say otherwise. 62. Take two, a little mistake there.
63, we're learning a new note, which is low G. So again, just I would recommend getting an idea of what that sounds like before you play it. Or before you play the example. Play the note. And, you know, uh, a little editorial on this idea of learning the note by just playing it and maybe doing a couple of crescendos or diminuendos on it before you play an excerpt that has it. Um, you know, you often will hear a band director or a teacher of kids say, you know, you always want to play with your best sound. Um, you don't want to. You don't want to go so loud that your sound spreads apart and falls apart and sounds ugly. That's well intentioned, but I think that it can actually be a really good exercise to play louder than louder than than it than possible, or, or louder than you can while maintaining a good sound. You know, how do you, how do you build a good sound when you're playing loud unless you eventually try, you eventually start to stretch what's possible for you. And at some point you're gonna have to come up to that wall of like, okay, I'm playing loud and it doesn't sound the best and start to go through it and go, okay, well, you know, maybe that's how you actually build dynamic range is like playing past what sounds good. So I think that actually for young students, it's a good idea to start to experiment with that early. Um, so take a note and take it actually past as loud as, as you know, you can while maintaining a good sound. Take it into the territory where you're playing really loud and maybe it doesn't sound great and maybe the pitch changes in some kind of a way or the tonality changes in some kind of a way because eventually that will help a young student and uh, you know e even a, a professional be able to maintain a good sound when they're playing loud okay that's a little bit of a rant but that's okay okay 63 now <laughs> This one's interesting because of the tie over the bar between the first two bars. So you're playing a downbeat, but you're not actually emphasizing beat one on the second bar. That's kind of cool, and um, they don't mention anything about that being unique, even though it's the only time that it's happened in this book so far. <laughs> skip 66 and I'll go right on to 67 which has the same rhythm as 66 again okay so now we're introducing 3 4 maybe a good idea to get a sense of what conducting in 3 4 really is like for you ta 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 ba, da, 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 da. you know um I guess use that at your discretion, but in my view, that's a pretty good tool to uh, 
start teaching people rhythm, especially at a young age. 67. <laughs> It's really sad. Uh, like, how did they decide who gets a um, which composers are good enough to get a special little note written about them? Like, Offenbach doesn't get one, but Grieg gets one from 68 to 69. Okay, never mind. <laughs> 68. <laughs> Emphasize the note, it says. Well, how do you do that? It doesn't really give you any idea. I mean, does that mean that you play accents louder? Does that mean that you play the notes that aren't accented a little bit softer? Does it mean that you attack the front end of the note and then diminuendo a little bit because they look like little diminuendos, right? Um, I guess rather than get into all of that stuff, it's easier to just say, emphasize the note. <laughs> and I don't know if I'm going to get into it too much right now, but that's food for thought. Like if you're a teacher and you're in fifth grade, how do you explain what an accent is? I don't remember the lesson that I got. Maybe I didn't get a very good lesson. Maybe my little fourth grade brain couldn't handle it. I don't know. But I'm going to have to play some accents in 71. So let's see what I make of them. <laughs> Because of the registers in that one, it almost is like the accents play themselves. But maybe I'm thinking about a little bit of a, you know, creating a little tiny bit of a space between each note that's accented. I'm not sure. I think that's all the more reason to, from the very beginning, be, be particular about, like, playing full value quarter notes or full value half notes or whatever the case is as you as you go through all the other exercises. Okay, so this one, you know, essential creativity, number 72. I'm not writing anything in. I'm going to just, you know, I'll do a little improv for you with the notes that we know so far. pretty good huh so no wrong answers really I mean especially if you use like the, the notes that have been taught already up to this point you really can't go wrong everything should sound pretty good okay number 73 so B flat just first finger on the right hand. And that's it. There's no there's no alternate fingerings for that. 
Get it, they call it hot muffins instead of uh, hot cross buns because it's like, I don't know, a new note from the first time that you learned that tune, so they got to call it a different thing. I, I don't know. I don't know what their logic was. Anyway, 74, and I will do the repeat in this one so that you hear what it sounds like because the repeat is like, you know, in the middle of the thing and not at the end. Yeah, the accents are definitely important in that one, and I'm not sure that I did the best job of showing what I think that they should sound like. Um, you know, the downbeat accents are, are pretty easy. Like, downbeats are emphasized naturally um, in the music. That's why they're called downbeats. These accents that are on the half notes uh, on beat three are the ones that I would make sure that I really... Um, was giving a little extra oomph too. Okay, B flat, number 75, learning another new note, high B flat. <laughs> So that's a good opportunity to talk about something else. Um, you hear that gurgling, obviously. So there's some water somewhere, and uh, it is actually water. Like, it's condensation. It's not spit. I'm not producing that much spit as I play that, uh, like, a key has filled up with my spit. It's, uh, it's water vapor that uh, becomes liquid water on the inside of the clarinet. Or, in this case, it's in this little register tube. So there's a tube. If you look underneath this other thumb key on the back, you can see there's a little metal like pipe that's sticking out and that is what has water in it right now so to clear it i'm going to open up this key and i'm going to put my lips as close as i can to underneath the key and i'm just going to blow really hard into that and it should blow the water out clear out that key and then our b flat should sound nice and clean yeah and if that wouldn't have worked um, there could also have been water in the other key that's open, which is this A key. So if you open that up, you look at where the pad goes, open that key up, do the same thing, and you would have cleared out the water that's in there. But mine doesn't really have much in there right now. So we should be good to go. I'll do that one more time, just so that you have a sense of what it sounds like. Nice and simple. Okay, so this introduces a new key signature, introduces repeating, first ending, second ending. Uh, somebody else can explain all of that. I'm not going to do that right now. It's pretty easy, and uh, it's pretty well laid out in the book here. <laughs> Seventy-seven now.
I like that last bar, the way that it emphasizes the two, which we haven't really... It's foreshadowed maybe a little bit earlier in the piece, but it's an interesting last few measures. <laughs> If I were arranging this, I might have put an accent on that low G, but I wasn't, so it's not there. Number 78. Check the key signature. Okay, the only key signature that we've learned other than C is key of F, which has a D flat in it, and this up on a house top doesn't have any Bs in it, so I don't really know why they're asking you to check the key signature specifically because there's like nothing that you could do wrong even if you didn't check the key signature but I guess that's not important. old Saint Nick. I'll play A with the repeat in the second ending so that you see what that sounds like and B with the repeat in the second ending. Second part it seems a little weird to me, but that's okay. The big airstream. I don't know why it's called that for number 80, but um, here we go. <laughs> So I'll make up a reason why it's called the Big Airstream. So for the last four uh, bars of this one, there's these two, you know, beats of rest that kind of interrupt the line. <laughs> and i think that you can think about keeping your airstream going this is going to sound weird but even through the rest and maybe even like even through the rest even if you're taking a breath in so like the line continues even though uh even though there's no sound happening in the rests like goes back to what I said way at the beginning, like you need to play the rests. So that's why it's called the Big Air Stream, even if that's not uh, why it's really called that. One thing that's weird is that, uh, you know, now they've introduced dynamics, but sometimes the book doesn't say like what, like it doesn't have a dynamic for the Big Air Stream, so what are you supposed to do? I don't know. 81.
So for 82, we're learning a new note, F. So I'll demonstrate again, like I've talked about before, like, I'm going to try to actually take this note louder than maybe I've ever taken it before. And it might sound bad at the end, but I think that that's okay because we're learning new things and we're, we're trying to actually stretch our ability. So F. Another note that I'll make about this is that, um, you know, there is an alternate fingering to F. It's not shown in the book right here, but it is shown in the book all the way at the back. So it wants you to play it with this right, uh, you know, bottom most right key. You can also play it with this left key that's, um, it's actually very difficult to, de to describe where it is in this little cluster, but it's this one right here so you know a good idea for students I don't you know however young they are I think that you can start teaching early like okay you push this right pinky key down and it closes this pad right so like this left key isn't what's making the note this right key isn't what's making the note F it's actually this pad closing this Whole. So, you know, maybe you could have your your clarinet class, or if you're teaching a, like a student privately, okay, this is what is supposed to happen when you play F as it's written in the book. Now, there's a key over here on this side of the clarinet that will make the exact same thing happen. Can you find it? There's only three, well, there's four pinky keys on this left side. They can hit all four of them and learn what the difference is and start learning some basic mechanics of what makes the instrument work early on. Um, so I'm going to do F now this way. See, sounds the same as what we started with. Because it's this that's making it happen and not either one of my pinkies necessarily. So, 82 now. Again, it's called a quiz, but I don't know what is supposed to make this a quiz. Eighty-five. Use these notes and improvise your own rhythms. That seems really boring, so I'm not going to do that right now. Maybe I shouldn't say that it seems really boring. But they're just whole notes. Like, that's not even going to... Okay, so I'll do it. It sounds, it sounds pretty nice. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. 18. Page 18. 
number 86. So I didn't obey the breath marks, I just did it all in one breath. Um, maybe that would be an interesting use of this one if you had somebody that um, was really interested in like growing as a, like if you had somebody that really was taking to the clarinet, you could say to them, hey, how far can you get without, you know, how far can you get on one breath and make it like a fun little game for, you know, one people or a couple of people or whatever. And that helps with the goal of this one, I think, which is to, like, it's the same airstream that makes all of these notes. Like, it's the same airstream that makes the F, that makes the E, that makes the D, that makes all the way down to the C. And even though it's, like, a short range from G to C, if you're just learning the instrument, like, I, you know, that might not be a super intuitive thing. Like, somebody probably needs to tell you that. So, 87. So, again, when I see these eighth notes, I'm going to go for long, like, pretty well-connected eighth notes, even though I'm tonguing them. Them. I'm not going to go for super short. That's something to start thinking about and trying like later on. 88. <laughs> And I think that that is a great one to practice this alternate left F on. And so I'll do that. So just to show you that I'm using this left F and not this right one, I'm going to keep my right pinky like behind the clarinet just so that you can see really clearly that I'm doing this. Uh, obviously, I don't ever recommend like actually having it back there just to make that clear. The book does a good job of, like, reminding you occasionally to make sure that you're you know, fingers are, are close to the keys and they're not going all over the place and stuff, but it's not specific enough about, like, how do you think about doing that when you have a, when you're operating one of the keys rather than just touching one of the tone holes. So, you know, something for when it says technique tracks to think about is, like, if you're playing this F, you know, whether or not you're playing it, uh, whether or not you're actually playing the F at the moment, you can have your key on, you can have your finger on the key. Like, you can have your finger on the key and it is still open. Um, so when you're doing, like, a technique tracks or something in this book, I think it's a good idea to think about always actually being able to feel the key with your pinky or with whatever finger is, is should be touching that key, whether or not the key is open or closed. Um if it's one that you're using in that passage. 89. Nice. And another little theme and variations for number 
Yes, very nice. Okay. This idea of the DC uh, is explained pretty well, I think, in the book. Um, so I'll just demonstrate what that looks like. Or what that sounds like, rather. <laughs> I didn't do a good job with the dynamics either. gonna do well actually there's an alternate fingering for this one that I think you know again I get it like if you're a if you're a fourth grade band director and you're teaching a class that has like 10 kids in it you, I don't blame you for like not having time to teach what these uh, alternate fingerings are but you know as somebody that's made it uh, through a lot of training for clarinet, I know that if somebody would have taught me these fingerings earlier and I would have actually like tried to do them earlier, uh, I would have been grateful for that experience later on. So like, just very briefly, F sharp, first finger, nothing on the back, nothing anywhere else, first finger, left hand. Another way to do it, thumb, not showing that very clearly, thumb, and then these bottom two trill keys, bottom two. Maybe they don't sound exactly the same, but they sound, you know, pretty close. So. I'll go through 92 with the fingering that they have here, which is just first finger, left hand. And now I'll do 93 with this other alternate fingering that you could learn as an option at this point. and we learned why they didn't teach slurred notes earlier on in the book because they needed to have their first uh, two exercises that demonstrated slurs have cool like names like smooth operator and gliding along get it because we're slurring the notes <laughs> uh, okay 95 96 right back to back
So there's a little note here that says, um, you know, tongue only the first note of the group that's slurred. Yes, that's true. Um, just make sure that you're really doing that. Um, you know, even even when I teach like really advanced students, it's uh, it's always a pitfall that like if there's a lot of groups that are slurred and then some of them are articulated at the beginning, somebody will always miss like tonguing one of those first slurred groups. So it is really important to like actually get the tongue in there where it's supposed to be. 97. Uh -huh. 